On this week's show, we talk about hodgepodge, transplants, cutworms, and doves. The weather's really been fantastic this week. It's changed from being that cold sort of spring to the warm spring. As a matter of fact, the last couple of days, the temperatures have been in the mid-teens, which would be uh, the 60s if you uh, go by Fahrenheit. Uh, so that's great weather to get outside, and it's also really a lot of things are popping up in that weather. You can see a lot of things turning green and a lot of um, plants starting to come out of the soil. Yeah, last week we were talking about looking at the trees, at the, how they were like starting to leaf out in a way that you could see the bud swelling. But now I'm just like looking at the ground and looking at all the, the green things that are emerging from the earth. Yeah, and the buds are swelling and we're going to have some blossoms out soon. I'm sure to the south of us, there's lots of things that have blossomed up, but we're pretty far north here in New Brunswick uh, and northern Nova Scotia. So we're still got a little ways to go. May 15th is about the time when everything is really going, which is about four weeks from now. But we're getting there. And because it was warm weather, we had an opportunity to do a lot of gardening this week. And the interesting thing about gardening is it's uh, supposed to be really good and healthy for you. But after gardening for four or five days, like, I'm really sore and tired. <laughs> what gives? I know. It's true. I find the har the first days of being outside and working in the fresh air are just like three times as tiring as later in the year. Uh, they just like really knock you out, all the fresh air, but in such a good way. Yeah. Who needs a gym? Like raking and wheelbarrowing and shoveling. Like these are all pretty good, you know. Yeah. Hauling around bags of soil, moving things from one area to another, you know, sawing, hammering. Weeding, planting. It's all good stuff. Yeah. So we planted some of our raised garden beds in what we're calling our hodgepodge garden. Yeah. So for those of you who aren't familiar, hodgepodge is like a vegetable chowder, comes via Scotland. And it's a basically a, yeah, a chowder. It's vegetables and cream and it's carrots new potatoes and beans or peas generally. And it is often sort of like described as an early spring chowder or soup. A lot of people will put it on the restaurant menus in May or even early June. And it's like, it's really hard to have anything like that from the garden until really the end of June, early July. So it's kind of a myth that it's a spring food. Yeah. Around here, it's a summer food. It's like a dish that's attached to the garden. So it's supposed to sort of be the first things that you're pulling from the garden, those like small little carrots and a couple of like new potatoes and, and some fresh peas. Uh, so it's, it's sort of tied to that experience of harvesting. And it's supposed to be really like it's fresh and delicious. Yeah. And it's, it truly is. That's the issue is just when people expect that they would be able to get a local version of that dish. Exactly. Yeah. And so we keep trying to do a specific, specifically plant as soon as we can work the soil, the things for a hodgepodge, um, as soon as they would be ready to see if we can actually have it in the spring without using greenhouses or hydroponics or anything like that. Like, but local, grown in the yard, hodgepodge. So we try to plant a hodgepodge garden every year and try to get it earlier and earlier. Yeah, so this year I'm doing an experiment, which is always exciting, where I've planted some transplants of some of these plants, like beans and peas, uh, and then I planted those out into the garden. So usually those are things I would just direct seed. Those are not things that transplant well. Well, they don't, people do grow them from transplants. It's more like they just, they get so big so fast, like anything that's growing from a seed that's large. Like if you think about like a corn seed or a bean seed, it's like, it's got a lot of energy in there and a lot of food. So it's going to germinate quickly and it's going to grow really fast and it's going to grow into a pretty big plant. And because of that, you don't really need to grow it inside because that, it, that would be for annuals though. Yeah. For annuals. Like a perennial can have a big seed and it wouldn't be necessarily as fast. Uh, it would be a faster growing and like a bigger plant than a small one would. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. in general. In general. I'm just thinking avocados, which can take a long time. Oh, yeah, that's true. They take a long time to germinate. But then once an avocado starts going, think about how big it is compared to like 
a tiny little seed that's germinating like a tiny little root. So the bigger the seed... The, the bigger the transplant. The bigger and the faster the plant grows. Yeah, definitely. Because there's more embodied energy within that seed. Exactly. It has more food stored in it. It has, you know, bigger cotyledons that are seed leaves that are already in the seed. So it's like really ready to go. Like beans are sort of the typical one that you learn about in like a biology class if you're thinking about like the different parts of a seed. And and yeah, they're they're amazing. So I germinated some inside and then I brought them outside and I planted them in the garden. And I did this specifically with beans because people always say that's a part of hodgepodge, but beans are actually like a later summer crop really because peas will germinate in like cold soil. They'll germinate super early. I always plant peas in April uh, just to see, you know, how early I can get peas, but beans, they need like, they need warm soil. So how warm? Uh, well, different kinds of beans, I was looking this up, have different uh, requirements, but like above 10 degrees, and even peas? like 15 degrees. Peas will go as low as like 5 degrees. So 10 degrees, that's you're talking overnight. Oh, I'm talking soil temperature, actually. But like, all, like that's 10 degrees soil temperature. Sustained. Sustained, overnight, daytime. So in the yeah. daytime... Like, of course, the soil can get up pretty warm if the sun's hitting it, but at night, it gets pretty cold. So 10 degrees overnight means that your nighttime temperature is probably over 10 degrees. And and like, I'm not sure exactly like how many hours of, you know, what kind of degree temperature. I mean, it's amazing because you think about just planting a seed in the ground as something so simple. But like, if you think about how many chemical reactions are happening in that seed to make that happen, like it's, it's incredible. So, so yeah, I, I germinated some seeds inside and then I brought them outside and planted them just when they were hardly coming up. So my idea was if I can germinate some inside and then bring them outside, maybe they'll be ready faster, but I don't know if it will work. So I also planted some seeds alongside those transplants. Right. And what was the first thing you discovered with your beans? Well, and the peas was there's an early season pest called a cutworm that ate some of them. Sounds like just the name of it. I know. So what does it do? So a cutworm is actually, I mean, it's like a generic term for a caterpillar of a bunch of different moth types that come out as a grub from the soil. And they basically, they didn't even eat the entire, like the entire shoot. They just ate a piece of it and then it fell over onto the ground. So what they girdled it. They girdled it, and in some cases, they cut it right off. So the shoot hence, was just lying on the ground. Hence the term cut. Exactly, worm. cut worm. I mean, when you look it up, you're like, okay, what ate this? And then it's like, oh, yeah, pretty so clear. So this happens often with pests where they will eat something. Um, you'll plant, like, a bunch of transplants, and you'll go out, and uh, they'll be eaten, they'll be skeletized, or they will be cut by cutworms. And the solution to this problem is? Uh, Figure out what did it. I find that's helpful to know. And then usually just plant more. I find that, you know, maybe uh, it's not going to be such a long-term problem because when I was looking it up, it said that specifically cutworms really like tender shoots. So, okay, the the peas that I brought outside that had been germinated inside, they did have very tender stems compared to the pea shoot that's going to be coming up from a seed outside the entire time. So maybe that is why I've never had problems with cutworms before. Maybe it's because I tried this experiment. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's interesting. So a couple of other things. So one is to try to just outplant, yeah. outcompete the pest. Another thing that I think you came across and mentioned, which I thought was interesting, was like to wrap the stems in aluminum foil, which is kind of ridiculous for something as small as a bean. Uh, It might work with a tomato or something, though. I'd say another idea would be for something like a cutworm. I mean, we're just talking about basically a grub that's in the soil. And I haven't had that problem in other places that I've planted beans and peas. So maybe just move change your garden plan and move things from one to another. A cutworm's not going to follow it across the garden because it's just this tiny little grub. So maybe you just say, okay, I guess there's some cutworms in this soil and then I'm going to find another place. Another idea that I would try if this continues to be a problem is to brush a little bit of neem oil onto the stems. So neem oil is 
uh, an oil from the neem tree. It's used a lot in organic uh, farming as a pest control. It's kind of, the science around it is developing more, um, but a lot of people use it. And what it does is it basically gives things that eat it really bad indigestion. So if you spray it on your plants and, and coat them with a bit of neem oil, then when the cutworm eats the stem and has that has the neem oil, the neem oil gives it really bad indigestion and can kill it. Uh, and it's non-toxic and it's not harmful to people like uh, like to people. Yeah, people use pets. it as like a cosmetic, like it's used on topically, not like ingested. Yeah, I was going to say it's not harmful to people like us or people like our pets. Yeah. <laughs> our pets aren't really people. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, uh, okay, so hodgepodge garden is off to a good start. We also planted our potatoes and our carrots. And yeah, I think that that is going to give us the earliest hodgepodge that we could get this year anyway, because we're putting things in super early and you even started transplants. And when do you remember when this would produce a hodgepodge? I was estimating like halfway through June. Halfway through June. So, so they're all basically like around 60 days to maturity, all of these plants, if you're looking at seed packages. So that's like baby carrots, beans, peas, uh, to potatoes we planted irish cobbler potatoes so those are like an early type of potato so it's 60 65 days so that takes us till the middle of june although you can't really go by those numbers as well when you're planting in the spring or in the fall because things don't grow as fast so so it might be more like late june late may and early june if you have a local restaurant that you go to and they have hodgepodge on there they got some questions <laughs> They got some questions to answer. So other than uh, the hodgepodge garden, we did, uh, what else did we do here this week? We moved our fig trees out of their sheltered uh, space in the garage. So fig trees grow really well in uh, northern climates and produce or can produce a lot of figs. We've been doing figs for a couple of years now. Last year was the first year that we got any real crop off of fig trees and it was just one tree and it produced a surprising amount of figs so they can grow and produce fruit in our climate but they don't do so well over winter anything below probably like minus 15 for cold hardy crops but minus five so you want to put them in a cold basement cold garage uh, greenhouse some people bury them uh, and then unbury them you know in, in in the spring which is quite a bit of work we just put ours in the corner of an unheated garage and just piled a hay all around it and covered it in row cover. And we pulled them out and they look good. Yeah, they and look they great. And they have some buds on them, like yeah. some green where they're going to leaf out. So they look good. And the, the, the two that we are growing, one is called... Chicago Hardy. Chicago Hardy. And that's the one that produced the fruit for us last year. And the other variety that we have is just called Desert. Oh, I think it's Desert King. Desert King. Yeah. So those are the ones that we're growing and we'll see how they're doing. The yeah. other thing that we overwintered that I just brought out of the basement uh, is pepper plants. Uh, we've over, they're actually perennial, which a lot of us just perennial think of them as... Perennial in warmer climates, yeah. Yeah, a lot of us think of them as annuals, but you can bring them in in the winter, prune them back really heavily, store them somewhere cool and dark, and then when the weather gets better, you can bring them out and get them to leaf out, and they should be ahead of your um, annual pepper in that they have already developed a, a large root and trunk system. And last year we did it with a couple of different varieties. I think we did a jalapeno and bird's eye, yeah. maybe another kind. They did really, they they did survive. It was a challenge. They were really, they did, we learned some lessons. And this year we planted some, or not planted, stored some over winter. But uh, so far they don't seem like they survived. 
Yeah, it's hard to tell. So it's kind of a hit and miss thing. It's unclear whether it's really worth doing, but it's, you know, it's always fun to try these things out and see yeah. what they do. And I, I think it's interesting, things like figs and peppers, where you're overwintering them, not by like bringing them inside and keeping them alive and green, which is sort of what you think of with like tropical plants. Like we have a lot of like... Uh, you know, different herb plants that we just bring in in pots because if we leave them outside, even like rosemary, they'll die over the winter. It'll get too cold. So we bring them inside. Uh, but these are things that actually do go dormant in the winter and have to go dormant and have to like have that part of their life cycle. But it just can't be to the extent of our cold temperatures in our climate. So you're sort of trying to artificially give it a less degree of dormancy, but you still have to sort of manipulate that and find somewhere that's good to, to yeah. be able to give them You're the, trying to give conditions. it like a North Carolina exactly. kind of winter. Yeah. Not a not a not a New Canadian Brunswick winter. winter. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so it's interesting, but it seems to be working. Yeah, the other so we, we have rosemary plants that we overwintered and they just stay green and somewhat lush. They're hard to keep from drying out, but four or five of those around that we've been putting out and then bringing back in. Um because uh, UV is really hard on plants that have been in all winter. The, it's not necessarily the cold or the wind that can really affect them, but what really gets them is they just get sunburned really bad and they drop their leaves. And then the other was I brought in a couple of sage plants, which over winter here, good. We've had a couple around that have been here for years in the garden, and I decided to bring some in as an experiment. I tried to do some research to see what uh, people did. I couldn't find any information on bringing in sage over the winter. So I brought in two plants. One I cut back, one I just left. And I guess they did about the same in the end. And they don't look very good. And they didn't grow or even when the light started becoming longer than like eight hours they didn't really produce much in the way of new leaves. So you couldn't really use them culinarily. Like you couldn't, like the rosemaries are fine. And like, yeah. if you need rosemary you for a dish, you just forever. go out to the atrium, you clip off a rosemary sprig and you use it. And that's the same. We have bay trees as well that we bring in over winter and you can just go pick bays. And the bays will grow like most of the time they'll put on new leaves but the sages didn't do so great. And, you know, the, there are sage plants outside that look almost as good. <laughs> yeah, and I planted out some other herbs that I'd grown from transplants like parsley and cilantro and dill, and then also seeded those in raised beds. So, yeah, again, so, another little experiment. Yeah, we talked about cilantro being a cold-loving yeah. plant, so that's interesting. And parsley, we had parsley in the greenhouse over the winter, and it yeah. just pops back up. And, it's, it's pretty cold-hearty. And it's worth reporting on the greenhouse, which is going nuts. The spinach in there is like growing so fast. It's loving the warm temperatures, but it's still the temperatures are uh, cold enough at night that it's not bolting. So it hasn't, you know, if anybody's grown spinach, as soon as it gets warm in the summer, it'll just start to flower and the leaves don't taste as good anymore. And it gets sort of tall and spindly and focuses on growing those flowers instead of growing leaves. But it hasn't started bolting yet and it just looks beautiful. The leaves are enormous. They're growing really quickly and we've been cutting those for salads in the restaurant. So that's really exciting. Yeah. And also in the greenhouse, we, we just for, you know, um, experimental sake through some uh, cilantro in the greenhouse over winter and it survived the winter completely and is bushing up. Yeah. So it it's very, very cold tolerant. And I think um, the other things that were in there that um, did well over the winter and are back up and running would be like Zatara oregano, which is something we think of being from the Levant from... Uh, Lebanon or that area definitely and then chives and uh some red leaf red veined uh, sorrel and yeah then yeah the red leaf sorrel that's like last year anyway it was the it leaf <laughs> like everyone yeah on Instagram well, had that it's commonly grown for microgreens but I think it looks really nice when it grows as like a whole leaf when they're a couple of inches big and uh it's a perennial in our climate which is amazing the other thing that we we like it's interesting to grow so because we are in new brunswick and this is like where there were a lot of acadian people i'm um very much inspired by acadian cajun connection 
So I like to do research and play around with ingredients from, you know, Louisiana and then other parts of the southern United States and even and the Caribbean as well. But we had a cold tunnel uh, just with row cover. So it's not really a cold tunnel, just like a couple of hoops with some like really flimsy row cover over it covering collards. So collards are cold hardy and they're also, they're biannual. So we just covered those up and left them out over winter. And we've done this for a couple of years and we've had some cold snaps over the last couple of years. So they will tolerate a lot of cold. Yeah. And then they're there and they're green. They're a lot like a kale. Like in yeah, that they, sort they of... survive better than kale though. Cause I put some kale into that bed as well. That was uh, in another part of the garden and uh, it died over the winter of kale. It sort of will survive sometimes, but not always, but uh, they're the same family. They're all brassica families. So any of those are biennials. So the first year you won't get any flowers from them, but then after that you will. So you can see, like, we've got, if you overwinter your peppers, uh, and then as a perennial, then you can have an early pepper. And so in the restaurant, we can have things like jalapenos and bird's eye peppers and other peppers, like maybe scotch bonnets or something like that, that we get early, as well as cilantro, which is cold hardy. And then you can have things like collards. And the other thing we try to grow often uh, with some success, uh, but limited, is okra, which you can grow around here as right. well. Right. I'm about to plant seeds for okra. I haven't done that yet, but it's one that does, you know, we've got four weeks, six weeks till it can go outside. Uh, and I think that's plenty of time for it to be inside. I've still been trying to not get too excited about planting too many transplants and just uh, focusing on yeah, giving them less time inside because then less problems can happen. But also less time inside, but also not putting things out too early. Things like okra, I think, and we always have problems with eggplants and some peppers as we tend to put them outside when the ground is not warm enough. Yeah. And apparently they can get a chill that they don't recover from. Yeah, the chill can actually impact their ability to produce flowers and fruit and it can like be, that's it for the plant. So with those, you want to start them late and put them out in yeah. probably June, like into June. And you know what? I, I think we talked about it in this year. I'm actually not going to try to even grow eggplant transplants because one of our local farms, Wismical Farm, they grow transplants and they sell them in the spring and they have beautiful eggplants and they also grow incredible eggplants on their farm. So I'm just going to buy some eggplant transplants from them. So I really recommend doing that, especially from local farms over the big box stores where you'll see lots of transplants starting to arrive in a couple of weeks. Uh, go to the farmer's market. I mean, those people are growing them for their farms and then they're giving you extra transplants. Like that's a huge gift because they've put so much like time and energy and love into that. So yeah, and the other thing too with the greenhouse is we actually like, even though it seems ridiculous, like we've cut like opened up the vents in it so that air can blow through it and so it doesn't get super hot. Uh, yeah, because we don't want the spinach to bolt. Like I don't want it to be 45 degrees in there during the so hot the, summer day. The crop that we have in there is cold loving, uh, not warm loving. Later we'll put in warm loving crops, but we'll put them in the summer when it's basically warm. And I think a greenhouse really is about minimizing the extremes and if you don't open up vents in your greenhouse, you're actually creating extremes, like extreme heat. Mm -hmm. Look it up to 40 degrees. Oh, yeah. And that's like extreme. So you want it to uh, moderate the extremes. You don't want it to create extremes. I always thought that the goal of a greenhouse was to get it as hot as yeah, possible. Yeah, as hot as possible, yeah. But that's not where plants, that's not the sweet spot for them at all. So it takes a while to learn and to convince yourself that, no, you actually want to roll up the bottom, you want yeah. to open up the doors and let the wind blow through it, and you're just like, but no, it's supposed to be really, really hot. Uh -huh. And maybe it should be if you're growing bananas or something. Yeah, yeah, totally, but not tomatoes. No, tomatoes don't like it really hot. That's another, like, I didn't realize that, and... They'll stop flowering if it's above what, like 35 or something like that. Yeah. So we also have a special guest in our backyard that has just arrived in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, we have um, a dove. Yeah. Well, two doves. Two doves, but we only see one of them at a time because they trade off and they're sitting on a nest in one of our hanging baskets on our patio. Last year, there were two eggs that uh, fledged out two little chicks and they hung out in the backyard and 
uh, it was awesome just to watch. And like, they are very close to us all the time. We're sort of walking by them when we're in the garden and they don't really mind. They're just chilling out. Yeah. So I think it's like the male is in the nest during the day and the female is out eating and then they switch and the male goes out at night and the female sits on the nest. Yeah. But morning doves, I, I, I don't know how to tell the difference between the male and the female. They look very similar. Yeah. Other uh, birds are more obvious, but those ones are pretty. And then, yeah, and then the birds fledge, they jump down, and then they hang out in the garden, and the the parents actually feed them crop milk, um, which is fan- f- fascinating and disgusting at the same time, but they just... <laughs> they regurgitate their own food. <laughs> For the babies. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, they're around and they're not particularly scared of us or the dogs. We have a couple of dogs that hang out in the backyard as well. So it's pretty cool that things can kind of get along like that. And there's lots, they eat seeds and there's lots and lots of seeds. They don't eat, they're not like cutworms. Yeah, exactly. Well, and actually like I think encouraging bird habitat in the backyard is something that we've been actively trying to do because uh, birds will eat cutworms. Like, you know, birds love to eat tiny little caterpillars. That's like one of the best uh, food sources. And, you know, even though there's lots of good caterpillars that we want beautiful butterflies to come out of, definitely they're also one of the biggest plant pests. Like if you think of those horrible cabbage loppers that are going to arrive at any point with the green caterpillars in the summer, like the more birds you eat those, the better. I saw my first uh, cabbage moth today. No. Yeah, already. Oh, geez. We have a problem with those. Yeah. But yeah, so in our backyard, we have these morning doves. There's sparrow, a uh, small like American song sparrow that uh, will nest uh, back there, chirp Korea. Yeah. And uh, then we also, it's interesting because we're very much an urban garden. We're surrounded by, you know, this small town, but like we're all asphalt and grocery stores and and uh, brick buildings and stuff like that. So it's very much urban. There are pigeons all over the place, but the pigeons never come into the backyard. They don't like it for some reason. And there are starlings around as well, and they never come into the backyard. But they do nest in the buildings, and the and the pigeons will be up on the wires, and they'll nest around us, but they will never come it's into true, the backyard. Eh? Only sort of like woodland uh, birds do. So it's really interesting how that works. Yeah, I guess it's just the types of uh, types of habitats that they're used to and that they like. It's great gardening weather, so we have to end the podcast and get back out there into the dirt. Uh, it's been a great week, and we're really looking forward to the many weeks of gardening ahead. Yeah, it's just getting started. 